do, do I go now? <laughs> I guess so. That's a tough act to follow. Solving uh, world hunger or talking about better game stories. Hmm. Okay, we are not, oh, we're not connected. Okay, while we're waiting, I'm gonna throw one out. <laughs> All right. Uh-oh, sorry. I figured somebody had to throw one close. There you go. Okay, we're good. Okay. Uh, do I need both of these mics? Yep, they'll go away. All right. So, uh, I have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, my, my team's always called me wordy bastard, and you're about to find out why. So, uh, if there's no time for questions, I'll hang out over, over uh, right outside here, uh, and you can come up and ask anything you might, you might want to ask later. Okay. Um, so, first of all, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, who I am. Uh, it's a little bit about uh, my background in gaming, just in case there's anybody here. Who, who doesn't know. Uh, I'm a 33-year veteran of uh, game development. Uh, I started in tabletop games, which uh, I could give a whole nother talk on, uh, working at Steve Jackson Games and TSR, the tiniest little game company and the biggest game company. Uh, but uh, there, there came a time when I realized that if the biggest decision I had to make in my life was whether to use 20-sided dice or percentile dice, I really needed to find another line of work. Um, um, and I was uh, I was playing computer games at that point obsessively, and so uh, went to work as an associate producer, I guess, at Origin. Um, later worked at, at Looking Glass on uh, on on some, turn your phones off. Um, uh, worked at Looking Glass uh, and Ion Storm, uh, and uh, later founded Junction Point. Uh, I was lucky enough to work on games like these. Um, Many of which are astonishingly still for sale, and and <laughs> yeah, Dan, you can still buy System Shock on Steam, which is just astonishing to me. Uh, you can still buy Tune. I recommend. No, anyway, um, I got to write choose your own adventure books and novels and comic books. Um, like I said, in 2004, I found a Junction Point, uh, a startup studio where we were working on an epic fantasy role-playing game called Sleeping Giants. There's a guy with a copy of Epic Mickey here. Um, uh, I got a deal to make that. That went away. I got another deal to make it. Uh, that deal went away. I got another deal to make it. That went away. So I, I was working with John Woo on a modern-day ninja game called uh, Ninja Gold, uh, featuring modern-day ninja Kat Sato. Um, we got a movie deal. That fell through. The game deal fell through. Uh, by the way, doing a startup is hard, <laughs> just as a note. Um, Valve stepped in and uh, we did some concept work for them, building an episode that never shipped. You can ask them why. Uh, we created some really cool player tools that I still wish they would release because they were really cool. Valve shut it down. Um, did I say doing a startup is hard? Uh, and then uh, along came Disney, where uh, over seven years I got to make two games uh, featuring Mickey Mouse, um, which was pretty cool. Uh, as a note, uh, Mickey and Mickey 2, well, ep Disney Epic Mickey, I should, Disney, like there's a laser pointed right at me right now. I need to get the name right. Disney Epic Mickey and Disney Epic Mickey The Power of Two um, were by far the best selling games I ever worked on. So anybody who tells you they were failures, just, you know, they weren't. Um, okay. Uh, in 2003, uh, 13, I, I went to the University of Texas uh, because I was looking for some new challenges. I'd been making games at that point for 30 years. Uh, and so I joined UT and created a program called the Dean of Sam's Gaming Academy, which is still running. We got 20 great students. Uh, everybody can go to itch.io and download the game Roots of Sarcos, which is what the, the team is working on. And uh, we're about to do a new release. I think it's on Friday, uh, which will have uh, cool Twitch support of a sort that you've never seen. 
Uh, so I, I strongly recommend that. Uh, but I was itching, uh, not itch.io, I was actually itching uh, to make uh, games again. So uh, recently I joined Other Side Entertainment, which was founded by a guy named Paul Nurath, who you may know as the founder of Looking Glass. Uh, and uh, Other Side is working on a, a spiritual successor, I guess, to uh, the old Underworld games. And uh, I'm going to get to make uh, a new System Shock game. Um, yeah, I'm kind of psyched too. Um, so, uh, if you're ex an experienced discipline lead and you want to talk about moving to Austin, come and talk to me. Um, okay, but we're not here today to talk about me, despite appearances. Um, we're here to talk about something else. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about traps. Uh, there are lots of game developers, even ones who specialize in narrative games, uh, who fall into several common traps when they think about games and stories, uh, and about the roles of players and developers in the telling of those stories. So, um, okay, here's a disclaimer. Uh, I am prone to make um, some might say outrageous statements, um, like VR is a fad, for example, um, uh, which are designed to provoke people into arguing with me. This may be one of those times. Uh, I am not trying to say that everybody should make games of the sort that I'm going to talk about today. I'm not saying everybody should play the games I'm talking about today. Uh, I'm just expressing an opinion, and I am an ex opinionated ass. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. There are five traps in particular. Uh, I want to talk about game stories as they uh, relate to uh, stories in other media. Okay, there is a, a misconception that they are just like yeah, stories in other media. I, I want to talk about game stories uh, being just about what they seem to be about, which will become clear in a little while. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, fallacy that games are, are all about choices. Uh, I want to talk about uh, consequences, and I want to talk about something that I call recovery, which I think gets too little press, I guess. Okay, so that's, that's the agenda for today. Uh, trap number one. Um, there are a lot of people who think that any series of events uh, with setup, complication, resolution, and denouement qualifies uh, as a narrative in any medium, whether it's linear or interactive. Um, and by the letter of the law, I guess that's, that's actually correct. Um, it's often expressed more rigorously in, in terms of the three-act structure, uh, setup, rising conflict, stakes raised, headlong rush to resolution and denouement, um, which can be summed up in, in uh, uh, more, more easily by saying, um, there's a tree, get your hero up a tree, throw rocks at him, get him out of the tree, everybody celebrates, okay? Um, that's kind of the three-act structure. Uh, and clearly this has a place in game narrative, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily the best or the only way to think about game narrative. Uh, I see uh, six specific video game structures that are not just like the Aristotelian three-act structure, okay? Um, now, again, not saying any one of these is better than any other. I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy games that follow one or the other. I'm just expressing my opinion, okay? Uh, and I appreciate all of these, depending on my mood, all right? Um, the first one is the retold story. Uh, games that have no um, explicit narrative, okay? The designers of these games, not only would they probably, they have in my presence denied that their games have any narrative at all. But uh, I think they've overlooked something important, that players inevitably construct narrative uh, out of their, their experience based on the minute-to-minute -minute events they experience when they play. Um, my experience of playing Tetris is different from your experience. And out of that experience, you might get a narrative like, wasn't it cool? I was waiting for that long straight piece. I was, it was almost up at the top, and I couldn't believe it. And then finally it came. And that is a narrative, in a sense. Okay? Uh, and in some ways, games that, that follow this particular structure, the retold structure, may be the most gamey of all. 
uh, in sandbox games, uh, designers go even a step further. Uh, they don't just ignore overt narrative. They don't care if a story emerges or not. Uh, they provide players with tools that encourage them to create narratives. Uh, Will Wright is fond of talking about how players created um, stories in The Sims that uh, expressed the, the horror of spousal abuse. That was certainly not on his mind when he made that game. Um, but there are sandbox games like, like The Sims um, that uh, allow players to exploit expressive tools to tell their own stories. Okay. There are roller coaster rides, um, much more conventional narrative. If you're going to find a three act structure somewhere uh, in games, it's probably going to be here. Um, this is a game with a predetermined narrative. Everybody's going to go through the same experience. Um, and in a game like this, uh, you can see the roller coaster looks complicated, but in fact, if you straightened it out, it'd just be a straight line. Okay. Um, games that fall into this category can tell great stories because the designers know exactly where you're going to be at every moment. They're gonna, they know every step you're going to take. The option is what gun do I use to kill that thing? Okay, that's the, the limit of player expression in those games. And I don't mean that in any bad way because these games tell incredibly good stories. Um, but it's because they're they're just stories. I was going to try not to be judgmental, but anyway. Okay. Then there, there's the uh, the branching tree, the old standby. Uh, it's been with us since the days of Choose Your Own Adventure books, uh, that which means since the early 80s at least. Um, these tend to be uh, kind of cinematic games, though not always, uh, and they offer the players interesting decisions to make. But again, they're really not very uh, interactive. They're, they offer players interesting decisions, but again, you're you're just on a couple different paths. If the creator of a game like this, with a branching narrative, doesn't explicitly plan something, it can't happen. Okay. So that's kind of the key there. Uh, the designer, the developer, is still in control of the experience, not the player. Uh, then we come to, uh, I will confess, my favorite, which is kind of a hybrid of the roller coaster and, and the sandbox. Um, and in this case, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a while, but in this case, the developer owns the narrative arc. So there is a, a three-act structure, there's a linear story, but the minute-to-minute -minute of play belongs uh, entirely, in, in an ideal sense, entirely to the player. So you can think of it as a string of sandboxes, okay? And I could talk about this all day, so if you want to ask more about that, we can talk outside. Uh, but think of this as a string of sandbox, uh, sandboxes, uh, where we share authorship, where the developer and the player have their role to play in the telling of a story and in the creation of a story. Uh, that's the best I can think of. Uh, if one of you knows a better way to structure a story, please do it uh, and teach me a lesson so I get to play a new kind of game. Uh, and then, of course, there's the procedural narrative, which uh, hasn't really panned out too well yet. Uh, it's largely uh, pursued in academic circles, um, but perhaps someday someone will come up with uh, a way to tell a, a really freeform story uh, where the developer really doesn't have to play much of a role. But uh, I don't think we're there yet. Okay, so again, all of them are equally valid, all have their strengths and weaknesses, um, but we don't need Aristotle to tell great game stories. Okay, so all of you writers out there, I apologize, but we don't need the traditional storytelling methods to make great game narratives. We have a variety of tools, we should use all of them. Okay. Um, so, all of those that I just talked about are unique to games, which makes them really cool in my book. But regardless of structure, I'd argue that game narrative needs something more. Okay. Trap number two. Uh, games are just about what they're about on the surface. Okay, they're just a series of events. However well structured, they're just a series of events. No more, no less. But 
before you plot out your magnum opus, uh, and regardless of your structure, I would argue that games have to be, game stories specifically, have to be in support of something, okay? Something deeper, uh, a meta narrative, unless you want to create something that just lets people waste a few hours uh, killing a bunch of stuff or solving puzzles. Uh, I, I urge you to think about this, okay? Before you start crafting your story, make sure you have something to say. That's true in any medium, okay? Uh, and given the quality of most game stories, I'm not sure a lot of people do think about this. Um, but for me, the statement I want to make is of paramount importance. Actually, I just lied. What's important to me is that unlike a novel or a movie, what's really important in a game is what I want players to grapple with, what I want to ask them, not what I want to tell them, what I want to ask them. So the key for me when I think about game narrative uh, is something a little different, okay? And here's, here's another way to think about it. Linear media answer questions. Doesn't matter whether you're talking about comics or movies or novels, uh, opera, they answer questions, okay? There's an author somewhere telling you, this is what I think. And your only uh, input as an audience is to say, well, I agree, you know, that's it. Um, games ask questions and then allow players to answer them, at least when we're at our best. Okay. Note that the word interactivity is nowhere to be found in this you know, defining characteristic. Um, the word is overused, ill-defined, I think it's kind of useless, uh, sort of like fun, um, which I'll come back to. Uh, again, games are about asking questions, letting players answer them. Okay, the real question is who's getting to do the answering in a game? Uh, so here's an interest, interesting exercise. Don't do this right now, okay, because I want you all paying attention to me. But think about the narrative games you've played, and then think about what questions they're asking you to grapple with. What do they want you thinking about? And then think about whether they answered them for you or whether you got to answer them as you played. It's an interesting thing to do, okay? Um, so let me give you two examples from games I worked on of what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, for me, Deus Ex is about four questions. This is, I don't even think my team knew about this. But for me, it was about four interrelated questions. What happens if you take a guy who believes in right and wrong and drop him into a world that's all shades of gray? Okay, I wanted players grappling with the idea that maybe there is no right and wrong. And you got to decide that as you played. What if every conspiracy theory that people believed to be true was true? That isn't so deep, but I thought it'd be kind of fun. Uh, and by the way, every single thing in Deus Ex was based on reality. Every single thing without exception. The team hated me because I made them do that. Um, as crazy as it sounds. There were even some things we, we found that were so crazy we couldn't put them in the game. Google Denver Airport Conspiracy, okay? <laughs> Uh, too crazy for the game. Okay, I wanted players thinking about what does it mean to be human? In a world of augmentation, human augmentation, at what point do we stop being human? And what does that mean? Also based on reality. Uh, and then how should the world be? There was no boss monster to kill at the end. Uh, what I wanted people thinking about was, is the world better off with total free will, but with uh, the world of technology like just destroyed? No internet, no interconnectivity, but free will. Uh, or is the world better off under the control of a, a, a sentient AI, um, which means no free will, but world peace? Uh, or is the world better off the way it is in the real world today under the thumb of a conspiracy that's doing a pretty good job, I guess. Um, and if you believe that, I don't want to talk to you outside. But uh, I really wanted people thinking about those questions. Um, so 
players answer questions. Basketball freak, sorry. By the way, there's a basketball hoop in every game I've worked on, uh, if you can find it. Wah -ha -ha. Um, okay. Um, yes, there's an overarching plot. Like I said, I'm, I'm egomaniacal enough that I'm not willing to give up that part of telling a story. Um, and yes, you play a character named J.C. Denton in that overarching plot. Okay. Um, but it's, it's the player that matters. J.C. Denton, he talks like this because I wanted him to be a cipher and I didn't want to try to impose an emotional response on him because the player might be angry and J.C. might be happy and that would really break you out of the game experience. Um, don't applaud that. It's terrible acting, man. The actor hated me, too. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, but the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay really, really does belong to the, the player. It's about, it's about you. It's about what you believe. Every minute of that game is about what you as a human playing the game believe to be right and wrong, not about what J.C. Denton believes. He's just a puppet, okay? Um, the character you play is, is secondary importance, and um, the plot is also of secondary importance. And I don't really care if anybody knows if I know what your answers are, okay? Um, I don't care if anybody knows what those questions are. No author that's any good says, here's my theme, you know? Um, but those questions, I think, have to be there, okay? Let me give you another example. Disney Epic Mickey asked a few questions, too. Uh, and it pains me that a lot of core gamers, if I can use that term, didn't even play the game. <laughs> to figure it out. Everybody else played the game, man. It was amazing. Kids and adults and families. It was outrageous. But core gamers probably still hate me. Um, but Epic Mickey asked players to think about a completely different set of questions than, than Deus Ex. Um, how important are family and friends to you? Notice, not family and friends are important, but how important are family and friends to you? Is it better to be powerful but alone? You're racing everything that moves is like the easiest way to get through the game. Or is it better to be to have friends who will assist you, to have power through community? Which is better? Is it better to solve every little problem along the way, okay, or in the in the, the overarching narrative? Or is it more important? You have a world to save for crying out loud. I don't have time to get a cat out of a tree. Okay. Which is which is better? Um, what happens when you remain rooted in the past? Is it is it good to forgive and forget? Or do you gain power by by, uh, by holding on to old grudges. And what does it mean to be forgotten? How does that make you feel? Uh, how does that affect who you are and who you become as a person? Again, players may not realize it, I say, okay? But they're answering those questions with every step they take in the game world. Um, now, just, just so you know, uh, there are people who think I'm crazy and that you should actually, at the end of the game, tell people, here are the questions I was asking you so they could really think about it consciously. Uh, your mileage may vary. I disagree, okay? Uh, we can argue about that later. But the point here is, regardless of whether you reveal the questions or not, reveal your themes or not, um, even a cartoon mouse can be the vehicle for asking big questions. Okay, so trap number three. It's not about, uh, but it, they're basically branching trees, okay? Uh, the choices don't matter very much, narratively speaking. You're still gonna be telling the story that the developer wants you to play. You can have choices uh, in games with a more open structure that are expressed through a player's interaction with mechanics. Um, see Bethesda, Bioware, and others. Um, that's okay, too. Happily, finally, most developers at least get this much, that choice is important in narrative games. But here are three widely held beliefs that I think people need to think about. Um, Games are not, by definition, about choice, okay? That's a trap, okay? It's important to get past uh, the idea that the medium demands choice just for the sake of choice, that that's what defines interactivity. Um, second is that any choice is a good choice. Look, you can go left or right. 
You know, if your choices are at that level, and a lot of games offer you choices at that level, do I kill this thing or do I not kill this thing? You might as well roll dice, okay? So choices should be, telegraphed is, is probably not the right word, but choices should be informed by what's going on in the game world and the player's understanding of it, okay? You want players making logical decisions, applying logic to the situation. And choices imply judgment. Um, man, there are developers who just love binary oppositions. I mean, it's because they think in zeros and ones. I mean, that's got to be the answer. Um, there's reward and punishment. There's good and evil. There's right and wrong. There's light and dark. Okay? I just don't get that. <laughs> okay? There's an obsession in choice-driven games with binary opposition. Okay? And I'll come back to that. Trap number four, uh, games don't need consequences. We've got choice, but what I'd argue really matters is not the choice, it's the consequences of those choices, not choice for its own sake. Uh, what's important is not designer-driven determinations of what, what, what's right and wrong, good and evil, okay? Choices without real consequences are meaningless, uh, especially if they don't lead to different outcomes, which often happens. I mean, if your, your game is always coming back to a point and your choices don't matter, um, get out of my medium, okay? That's trap number four. In a very real sense, I mean this, choice just doesn't matter, okay? And games that offer consequences that are binary, right and wrong, light and dark, I call it playing the meter, uh, are just silly. Ooh, I'm, I'm evil now, I have horns and a tattoo, you know? Uh, I'm good, I'm, I'm the white side, you know? So I have a white robe, I, you know? Um, playing the meter is just silly. And now I will never work again, and I've just lost six friends. <laughs> Um, the interesting aspect of choice isn't the choice itself. I'm going to keep coming back to that. The interesting thing is the real consequence, okay, um, driven by the player's choice, by the logical choices they make. It's the consequences that are important. Uh, choice without consequence, waste of time, waste of money, waste of effort, don't bother, write a movie or a, or a novel. Okay, but a lot of people think that choice or that consequence implies punishment or reward, which sends us right back to playing the meter, okay? Uh, and my answer is no, okay? Consequences can be more meaningful than that. Consequences can mean, uh, in Epic Mickey, depending on how you played, you wouldn't learn about a quest or a, a character wouldn't help you, wouldn't give you information. Um, in Deus Ex, you might not get uh, a weapon. Something really tangible and concrete that has nothing to do with right and wrong, playing a meter. It's an in-the-moment consequence for a choice that the player's making. You might strengthen one faction while we, we, uh, weakening another in a game that has factional play. So, uh, the other thing about meters that I don't like is that they say, I'm the designer. I know what's right and wrong, and I'm going to tell you. Okay? Uh, I think that's terrible. Um, one of the hard and fast rules I lay out for all of my teams is never judge the player. Never. The fact is, players should never know what you think about a question or its answer. No one in this room knows what I think the right answer is in Deus Ex. Not one of you, and none of you ever will. Okay? Um, players shouldn't know what you think. You're not there to answer the question. Okay, it's hard for you to wrap your mind around this. Designers always want to show off how clever and creative they are, but the reality is you're there to empower players to show how clever and creative they are. You're there to, to allow them to answer questions. Okay, uh, right and wrong are irrelevant. Designers provide opportunities for player expression. We want players testing behaviors in the real world and seeing the consequences of those behaviors. We can do that. We're the only medium in the history of humankind that can do that. 
okay, that doesn't dictate, that doesn't judge, that allows players to walk in someone else's shoes. The only medium in history that can do that. And the other, the, finally, players will judge themselves, I promise you, okay? Uh, they will decide whether the cost of making a choice, the consequence, was worth the cost of making that choice. Uh, and I think one of the cool things is, even in the context of a fantasy game or a science fiction games, game, that kind of reflects the real world. I mean, I, I will confess that I am a, a moral relativist, you know? Um, but in most real world cases, if not all, there are only shades of gray. Right and wrong are not readily apparent, unless you're an extremist or a true believer in some something or other, or a cult member or something like that. Um, at, at the very least, I'm comfortable saying the most interesting uh, cases in the real world uh, are the ones where right and wrong are not readily apparent. And I don't understand why more game developers don't want to reflect the marvelous lack of clarity in the real world, okay? It's, it's wondrous, the world we live in. Okay, so choice, logical consequence, hugely important. And trap number five, this is another one that even people who buy into choice and consequence gameplay don't think about enough. Um, there's, a, there's another trap, okay, and it goes a little deeper. Um, okay, we offer choice, the game notices what you've done, which is really cool, the game responds, revealing consequences, but from that point, two things I think should happen. Again, just my opinion. The game should play out differently as a result of that consequence. Um, Creating unique experiences is the coolest, most powerful, unique characteristic of, of games. At the end of a game, if every player describes the same experience, why did you bother making a game? Okay, why did you bother? Uh, if at the end of a game, every player describes a unique experience, then you're on to something, okay? That, that is, for me, the, the defining characteristic of the medium. However, <laughs> In most cases, if you have a choice and a consequence, you need to allow players to recover from that consequence. If they say, ooh, man, I really didn't like what just happened, you need to let them recover from that, okay? And let me tell you what I mean. There's microscale recovery. In a stealth game, if a player alerts guards to his or her presence, and the game just turns into a shooter because all of a sudden every guard in the game is, is on alert because they know you're there. You, you fail. The, the player, by sneaking around, is telling you, I want to sneak. And so you need to allow them to get back to a state where they can sneak again. All right? Guards need to go back to their pre-alert state. That's what I mean by recovery. On the macro level, in, in Deus Ex Invisible War, I, I will confess, in Invisible War, the, the first sequel to Deus Ex, we decided to allow players to change factions at will. There were multiple factions in the game. And we allowed you to change at will. And all that did was it meant every choice you made was completely irrelevant. Okay? Because recovery is an art form. Uh, it's almost impossible to know when the right moment is to have the guards go back into a state of pre-alert, okay? It's almost impossible to know how, how difficult, hear the, the inflection there, how difficult it should be to change factions in a game that has factional play. Uh, like most aspects of game design, this is an art, okay? It's not science, uh, so don't expect answers here. Just know that recovery is vital, okay? If recovery is too easy, like I said, choices become meaningless. Uh, if recovery is too hard, uh, a player who wants to be fighting everything might find, find him or herself doing something completely different. Uh, balancing that ease and difficulty is art, okay? But if you want to make a game of choice and consequence, and I hope everyone in this room will, unless maybe you're making a puzzle game, um, you have to think about this, okay? So, how do you do that? You play a lot. <laughs> you play test with outsiders a lot. You watch how they're playing. 
uh, you tune and tune and tune and tune until someone, probably whoever's giving you the money, drags the game out of your cold dead fingers, you know? Um, but find the right, the right timing for a cover. Okay, so let me bring the various parts of this trip down mem uh, memory lane, narrative lane, uh, full circle. Okay, I want to close by saying uh, just a few things. Again, just my opinions, not universal. Uh, I'd be thrilled if you all agreed with me, uh, but okay. A successful game narrative isn't one that tells a great story, a traditional story. That's not the definition of a great game story. A successful game narrative is one that asks questions. Okay. A successful game narrative is one that allows players to answer. Remember, it's not about you. It's about players. Offer choices. A successful game uh, allows players to answer those questions through their playstyle choices. I'll tell you another story. It's, I've got, if you go to my blog, which I update like every 12 years or something, um, go to really towards the beginning, one of the earliest blog posts I did was I, I posted my mission statement, you know, and it was 12 pages long um, and no one would read it. And so I made a, an eight page version and no one would read it. And I made a four page version and no one would read it. And I made a two page and a one page and a one paragraph. And you guys are not readers, damn it. Okay, so I summed it up in two words, which I, I got, in, I got, you know, those vinyl things you can put up on a wall. I got, uh, what are they, what are they called? Those silly, like, sports guy things. <laughs> yeah, fatheads, yeah. So I got, I got big letters that were made of the same place, and I, I put up on the walls all over my office, play style matters. I summed it up in two words, and everybody, there was a revolution in the office when people came in on Monday morning and saw that I had done that. Um, but I, and they said, we know this. We've, we've seen your manifesto. We listen to you rant about this all the time. And I said, if you know it, why aren't you doing it? Um, I, I told you I'm an opinionated ass. I warned you at the beginning of this. Okay. Um, but offer choices that players answer through their playstyle choices. Playstyle matters. Okay. Allow them to apply logic and personal preference to problems. Show them the consequences. A great game narrative shows consequences um, of both local and global decisions without judging players, never judge your player, uh, for making those decisions. Just show them the consequences and every choice should have a unique uh, consequence that follows naturally from it. A successful game narrative is one that allows players to recover from choice and consequence on both the micro and macro levels, like I said. Okay, um, That ensures that the narrative is the one that they tell. The experience that they have is driven by their play style, and therefore they get to express their desires. And at the end of the game, they will describe completely different experiences. Okay, again, don't judge players. Uh, acknowledge there's no right and wrong. Uh, this is the one where I, I, I've lost all of you. I just saw your eyes completely glaze over. Um, go ahead and make your games of right and wrong and have them play the meter, I don't care. Um, but remember, all, all choices should have costs as well as benefits. Um, like I said, I'm a moral relativist at heart. Uh, what you want to do is encourage arguments. It sounds crazy, but one, a successful game narrative is one that gets people talking uh, about how each player solved a game problem, what choice they made, what consequences there were. Okay? Most of the dialogue we hear around games is about optimal strategies for defeating that monster. Or how did I get through the, how, how do you get through the blue door? I can't figure out how to get through the blue door. That's not the kind of uh, discussion you want players having. I mean, how dull that is, you know? Um, 
and how limited. So what I want and what I hope you want is to hear things like this. Uh, all of these are examples right out of, out of Deus Ex. If you look even the, to this day, the kinds of discussions people have about Deus Ex, here's what you hear. How could you have stolen that? It's not that stealing that thing is right or wrong. It's how could you have stolen that? And then another player describes the thought process behind the, 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 uh, the theft. Why did you leave that guy alive? He was a terrorist. Why did you leave him alive? Uh, I want to hear one player making a Gandhi-like case for leaving, leaving that person alive. And another play, player saying, how could you have done that? I want players getting to the end game saying, how could you think that end game was the best? All right. I want to hear things like this. This is a true story. Uh, shortly after we shipped Deus Ex, uh, I was at a conference like this, and I did something I never do. Do not ask me to go out for a drink with you, okay? But for some reason, I said yes. I don't know why. And so I'm in a bar with a bunch of crazed Deus Ex fans, and one of them, a drunk guy, sits down, a drunk fan, <laughs> sits down next to me and says, how could you make that right-wing piece of crap? And before I could answer, another guy walked up, also drunk. Right-wing piece of crap. It was left-wing propaganda from start to finish. <laughs> and, and here's the power of what I'm talking about. They were both right because of the way they had played. And I got up and walked away and left them arguing. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, how much cooler is that than, I got outflanked by the, uh, the, the, anyway, you get what I mean, right? Okay. Uh, I want players thinking about what's appropriate. I want players thinking about what's right. I want players thinking about what's ethical. Those are magic words. And other media can claim that they deal with those concepts, appropriate, right, and ethical, too. And they do, OK? But in those media, those words belong to an author. While in games, those words can and should belong to the player. When you wrap your mind around that, we're actually on our way to realizing the potential game, uh, of games as a unique narrative form, as an art form. Okay, I used to be ashamed to say that, but screw it, we are art, or we can be. Okay, and clearly we owe something to earlier narrative models. There's no question, but we have to build on those teachings and maybe even leave some of them behind. Embracing choice, as most of us have now, means we're a third of the way there, okay? We don't think enough about consequence. We don't think enough about recovery. We don't think enough about play style mattering, okay? We still insist that, that our creativity is paramount uh, at the expense of, of players' ability to tell the stories they want to tell. Um, how about we go uh, the rest of the way and make ourselves a true art form? So there you go. That's what I got. Sorry, that wasn't very keynotey. I probably should have had that on the narrative track, but oh well. Um, any questions? Yeah. Do you think that recovery is the purpose? The question is, uh, does recovery negate the idea of consequence? Uh, the answer is no. That's what I was trying to say. The, the art is in uh, making the recovery just hard enough that it doesn't negate the consequence. It might, I, your, your game is going to differ from mine, but in, in a game like Thief or Deus Ex, some people complained that when a guard was alerted, they went back to their normal state. I mean, they would say, did I hear something? I know I heard something. There he is. And you would go hide somewhere, and like 30 seconds later, they would say, it must have been a rat, you know, and go back to their 
controls. You could argue that we should have made that, that uh, ramp down a minute, but the reality is, it's like I said, the art is in discovering the right amount of, of time, the right amount of difficulty for recovery, and specifically, that's so you don't negate the consequences. In Invisible, Deus Ex Invisible War, we completely negated the consequences. You're absolutely right. That's a real risk. Yeah. Yeah, I think, how do I feel about Dark Souls? Uh, <laughs> no, hey, don't laugh. I actually think it's amazingly cool. I just wish I could play it, because it's way too hard. Um, I've, I've watched people play. <laughs> And, well, lots of people love that game, and I think with some reason. I've, I've talked to a lot of people about it, and it sounds like um, a very interesting approach to narrative, but I'm on very thin ice when I talk about it because I really did try to play and died a lot. <laughs> uh, let me see, anything? Yes? Hi. Yeah, I, I, okay, the question is, can I talk about um, choice as it relates to gameplay as opposed to conversational choices? Um, the, the important thing to me is that narrative and gameplay not be divorced. That's why I, I always say play style matters. You know, If you go in guns blazing, that should result in different consequences than if you sneak around, right? I mean, if you go through the air vents in Deus Ex, you're going to have a different experience than if you go in with the biggest gun in the game and start firing away. Uh, in Epic Mickey, you're going to have a very different experience if you erase everything that moves, and, and doesn't move for that matter, uh, or if you go and paint everything. If you're Storing the world, that gets you one thing. Oh, by the way, since you didn't ask, um, how many people in here have played Disney Epic Mickey? I don't expect, oh my god, that's more of you than I thought. Um, did you realize that the end game cinematic was constructed dynamically, on the fly, in real time, based literally on exactly what you did throughout the game, and there were thousands of potential end games? Did you realize that? No, nobody realized that. Um, yeah, okay, and anyway, that's sad to me. Uh, you try creating a dynamically generated movie sometime. It ain't easy. Um, okay, yeah, but you want it. I don't even, okay, here's the other answer to a question you didn't ask. Um, we have made, someone convince me I'm wrong at this outside, by the way. We have made zero, zero progress in conversation since 1989. No, oh, no, wait. There, you can have a timer on a, on a choice. You know? I mean, I was writing Pick a Path books you know, in the 80s, and we've made no progress since then. Uh, somebody needs to fix that, and I'm not smart enough to do that, but someone needs to fix that. <laughs> yeah. If, if gamers already enjoy the games we're making, why change? Um, because most of the games we make are pathetic. Um, I'm really big on ensuring I'll never work. Um, because the, the implicit assumption in that question is that the games are a solved problem. Uh, you know, the. This isn't quite as strong an argument as I'd like it to be, but the position of sprocket holes on a film hasn't changed since 1895. You know, the way sound is recorded in, in film has changed only minorly since the 1930s. Uh, movies, uh, the, the way movies are now, the way they're edited was actually it, it builds on ideas that were created in the 1920s. 
Um, movies, I would argue, are kind of a solved problem. And if you think games are a solved problem, you're just not thinking hard enough. Um, we have a lot more we can and should do. And, and so for me, I mean, one of, I have a lot of rules. Um, and actually, uh, I'm going to talk about this in my talk this afternoon, so I won't go too far into this. But one of my rules is every single game, I don't care if you're making a Barbie game, every single game you work on should have one new thing in it, one thing that no one in the world has ever seen before, period. Because we're not a solved problem yet. Uh, and so I think there's kind of a moral imperative to, to do new things. Um, and I would also argue that um, we're not doing all that well. Uh, just from a commercial standpoint, we're not pleasing a lot of people. I mean, we are. We're, we're a hundred billion dollar business, according to one analyst now, which is enormous. But we're a hundred billion dollar business by overcharging for a niche product. Okay? And, and I, I would bet, this is, this is totally a lie that I'm making up right now that might be true, but I bet more people went to see up. Uh, in its first weekend, or uh, you know, the, the new Star Wars Force Awakens. I bet more people saw that in its opening weekend than to play a Call of Duty game. You know, so there's still plenty of growth we can do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, how do you handle the easy recovery? You say people the game and look at Ah, the save load argument. Um, I will just say that uh, there are there are secret masters of gaming, you know, forums and email lists and all that sort of stuff. And that argument's been going on since 1989, <laughs> uh, and there is no good answer for it. Um, the one of the the things that most depressed a lot of people on the Deus Ex team was that well, okay, what I expected was that people would pick a play style and just go with it. This is what I think is fun. I'm just going to play that way. And what we saw was people would get to uh, a choice point. And we tried to tell people, this okay, this is a choice point. You're about to make a decision. There are going to be consequences. Um, and they would get to one of those choice points and they would save the game. And then they would try one path. And then they would go back to their save game and they would go try another path. And then they would go save the game and try another, you know, they would try all the different options and pick the one that they just liked the best. And initially, a lot of us were really upset about that. But then, you know, at some point, once players buy your game, it's theirs. It's not yours anymore. And if they're having a good time, if they're having fun, more power to them, you know? Um, I just, I don't, personally, I don't think it's realistic to make a game that doesn't allow choices unless you're, I mean, uh, save games unless you're making a roguelike or something, or, you know, like maybe Dark Souls would survive without saves, but, um, yeah, maybe not. Um, but uh, I think you need save games. I mean, what if, what if, you know, I mean, my, my wife says, hey, dinner is ready, uh, and I don't, I can't save the game. I mean, you know, you, you got to have saves as far as I'm concerned. But there's no good answer for that. If you answer that, you belong in the secret master of gaming club. Yeah, all the way in the back. Um, in terms of choices and consequences, how much do you believe in being implicit for a character uh, from the perspective of a player versus the game giving them feedback of this person died or like, how much do you think you need to be implicit? Well, the, the, the kind of core concept, the, the, I, I'm, I'm a guy with many mottos, okay? Playstyle matters is one. Uh, Another is shared authorship. That's a you know one of the things I love about the the games that I've worked on is they're they're kind of a dialogue. They're a dialogue between me and the player. Every time you play uh, Epic Mickey or Deus Ex or you know the Ultima games I worked on, I'm standing right over your shoulder watching, and we're having a dialogue. So it's a balance. It's not just that the game decides or the play the uh, player decides. It's it's this this wonderful, you know, we're negotiating what should happen. So in some cases, under some circumstances, the consequence is a player, a character dies. In others, uh, well, no. Actually, if the player kills a damn character, that character should be dead. Period. No. I just way overthought that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not 
not a technical person, so take this with a grain of salt. I think this is entirely a question of design and the will to tackle the problems. Um, I will, having said that, uh, another, this is a whole other talk, but uh, I think we've done a pretty good job as, as a medium, as a community of um, combat AI. I mean, enemies can now outflank you. Oh boy. Um, but we've done an absolutely terrible job of non-combat AI, which is a whole other talk. And if you keep watching the System Shock 3 information that comes out, you might be interested. Yeah. Walking simulators. I would argue that they they fall into the uh, the retold story category, um, where the that's that's an overstatement actually. I mean, like Dear Esther has a, sort of a narrative, I guess, um, but I think they're interesting, and I'm not sure they're games exactly. Uh, there's something else that I find fascinating, but very different than what I'm talking about. I warn you out? No, okay. Earlier you said that um, if you make a game, you should do something that no one's ever done before. My mom's in a master's program. She just got her second master's in her doctorate. And they have this thing where they have to do, write a paper on something new. Oh, yeah. Not write the same thing. And it gets to be help in people in Sweden, to help a great year of murders in Sweden, to help in great year of murders Okay, so the question is, uh, to paraphrase, in, in academia, uh, if you're writing a master's thesis or a, uh, a, a PhD dissertation, I wrote my master's thesis on the history of Warner Brothers cartoons, by the way, um, that it gets more and more reductive, right, and, and therefore less and less valuable. Um, I, I don't have a great answer other than the fact that in games there are still all these really gross, enormous problems to solve. You know, um, it, it's, I'm trying not to name names here, but there are lots of games that people just think are phenomenal that are recreations of games that were made in 1989 with better graphics. You know, we still have so much growing to do as a medium that I I don't think we're in any danger of of going there. You know, we, there's there are still big new things to be explored. Yeah. I don't think there should ever be a not right answer. I mean, I'm I'm in the minority on that. Clearly, if you look at most games these days. There's a variation on that that, that I find very interesting. Um, when what, what I like to think about in terms of the choices in, in my games is, is this. Ooh, I want this and I want this, but I can only have one. Arg! You know, that's that's kind of what I like to do. And if you talk to the guys at Telltale, they're they the way they talk about a similar thing is they make games where there are no good choices. Um, but what that means is it's not that there's a wrong choice or something bad. It does mean something bad always happens, but the bad is based on your sense of what's ethical or moral. Okay, and that's that's games in a nutshell. If it's saying more about you as a player, as a human, than about the puppet you're controlling, I mean, there's there's no ethical decision making when you're playing Lara Croft. It's just go and do it, <laughs> you know. Um, so if it's about you, not about the the character, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love 
love Undertale. Right. So one of the things about Undertale is no matter what, whatever choice you make, they're like, and they will remember whether you start or not. The characters remember that you killed them or that you met them or that you're starting from the same plot. So how do you feel that that would impact more, uh, I guess, like the bigger game the AAA type? Uh, it might solve that the problem of, ooh, I'll try all these options and see which one I like. It certainly would solve that. But it would undo the idea of replayability for me. Um, uh, I have a friend who's not a, I shouldn't be ignoring this side of the room, sorry. Um, I have a friend who's uh, not a, a real gamer who's played through Deus Ex seven times. Um, I heard from people who played through uh, Epic Mickey half a dozen times. There was one guy, I, this is a true story, I, at, at uh, a GDC, a guy came up to me dressed up as J.C. Denton and said, I have played Deus Ex 63 times. And then he told me words that were magic to my ears, I'm moving back to Germany. You know, because but but the fact is, uh, took a while to sink in, didn't it? Uh, but the, the fact is, the Undertale approach would kind of undo that. I want players to be able to play through it a bunch of different times and have a unique, a different, unique experience every time, and that would undercut that. So I, I wouldn't do that. I I love Undertale. Don't get me wrong, but I I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Now I'm going to ignore all of you. Uh, what do you think uh, in five years, what will happen between AAA and the indie market? Uh, what's going to happen in five years between the AAA and indie market? Uh, I hope ne'er the twain shall meet, because like, frankly, the indie stuff is way more interesting than AAA right now. Um, what I do hope, um, and I have to choose my words carefully here, uh, what I do hope is that we rediscover what you might call the mid list or triple I. You know, I think there's there's this tiny world and then there's this enormous world and we're missing out on a whole bunch of player driven stories that we could be experiencing in the middle. And my hope is that that makes a comeback. Yeah. Yeah, what about Life is Strange? Um, I, again, I enjoy playing lots of games I wouldn't make. And I, I enjoy Life is Strange. It's a little kind of click and point and click for me. And I think they came up with a very interesting approach to recovery. Um, but I think it kind of undoes the consequential nature of choices. But I, I played it and loved it. I mean. You know, I'm, I mean, and I, I love Telltale games. By the way, I, I have a reputation for not liking Telltale games. I love Telltale games. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't, I didn't hear your question. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I am the most pathetic wretch on the planet. All of that stuff I was talking about today, my entire career, all I've wanted to do is capture the way I felt in 1978 the first time I played d and I mean, it's, it's, thank you. Um, the, that, that night, I'll never forget it, um, I, I realized that everybody could be a storyteller. And I was telling, I was not being told a story. My, my first dungeon master was a guy named Bruce Sterling, who's a science fiction writer of you know, some note. Um, and he's a great storyteller, but he wasn't telling us a story. We were telling a story together, and that's all I've been trying to recreate. I've been trying to recreate it in a single player setting because I just like single player games. But, uh, and I think you know, multiplayer is kind of cheating. But um, no, I mean, that was hugely influential for me. Yeah. You talk a lot about uh, designing with a question in mind for small players. Do you see a lot of value in asking players questions that they may not necessarily be able to answer? Ooh. Do I think it's important? 
important or interesting to ask people questions they don't know how to answer. I think that's inevitable. You know, I mean, how important are family and friends to you? Is, is, they're, they're kind of questions that don't have a right answer. The idea is just to get people thinking uh, and talking. Um, so it may be, it, maybe that's a simpler question than I, than I, I thought at first. It, I, think, I think that's great. If the answer is easy, the question probably isn't worth asking. You know? By the way, someone has to kick me out of here at some point. I'll go all day. Yeah. I think it's better to have uh, an open world that you can explore and really create your own story with, with no guidance from a designer, or is it better to tell a linear story that players explore? Um, I th think it's more satisfying. Look, if everybody was a storyteller, everybody would be telling stories, you know? Um, novelists write novels because they're better at it than we are. And so I, that's why I prefer the, the shared authorship idea, because players, players are really good. Have you ever listened to someone describe a D&D campaign? I did this, and then I did this, and then we did this, and then this happened, and then we did this, and then this happened, and we did this, and then this happened, and we did this. It's like the most boring story in the world, uh, except to the, the people who experienced it. Like, it's Moby Dick to them. But uh, for the most part, it's just, it's a boring story, which is why um, I have compromised on the idea of shared authorship. Not, not, I'm not going to tell you a story, and you're not going to create one from scratch. I'm going to own the narrative, and you're going to own the minute to minute. And that's, that's the best compromise I've been able to find. The, another way to think about it is, I think designers uh, create context for, for players, player choices and consequences and recovery. We create context. Um, it's way more interesting to say, your brother is being held captive by terrorists you know, than it is to say, and you know, you say, I'm knocking the door down, I'm going in, guns blazing, and I'm going to rescue him. That's way more interesting than saying, I, I click a, I press a button, and the door shatters, and I put a red pixel on a, or a brown pixel on a white pixel, and it turns into a red pixel when I pull a trigger. Um, and if we let players tell the story from start to finish, they, they wouldn't have that savior your brother context, which is what makes the choices they make interesting and, um, and worthy, I guess. Yeah. hate stats and numbers. If, you, if you're playing a game that has character classes and secret die rolls, stop playing now. I wouldn't do stats and number crunching. The, the reason Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson came up with the idea of character classes and, and, and D20s and, you know, and crazy dice is because they had no better simulation tools. We, in our medium, have way better simulation tools than that. And we should be using them. I, I have no patience at all for, for character stats and die rolls. I just don't play those games. And I wish nobody did. You know, I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. I, I want to keep morality in players' hands. Has a publisher ever uh, tried to force me to to make the endings more more comprehensible? Um, publishers have tried to make me do a lot of stuff, uh, and my answer is always no, uh, because. 
if you're willing to say no, I mean, if you're willing to walk away, the way to win a negotiation is to be willing to walk away from it, okay? And I've always had the belief, even, even when I was just starting out, I was a lowly little, you know, game, the rules developer at Steve Jackson Games. If they had said, you know, do something that you don't want to do, that I didn't want to do, I would just, I'd go open a bookstore or something, you know? I mean, you have to, you have to have some integrity. I mean, you have no idea how many times I've heard the words, why don't you just make a shooter? And the answer is no, I won't do it. By the way, don't do that. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a dangerous way to, to forge a career. <laughs> and I don't know how I've gotten away with it. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> uh, I think Bioware does terrific work. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned here, talked about how uh, in terms of the infrastructure being in five ways, sort of outside of the traditional forms of other media. Is there any way in particular that you can take forward from sort of other media that's not in terms of the infrastructure? Are there elements that we should be taking more of from other media? Yeah, that we should be looking more closely at other media. I got a whole other talk about this. Um, it depends entirely on what kind of game you're making. Uh, if Telltale doesn't understand at a deep and fundamental level the, uh, the rules of cinematic editing, they're gonna make a very bad game. So they need to understand that. For me, it's just the opposite. If, if I try to introduce parallel action, uh, you know, or any kind of, of uh, cinematic editing into my games, they're, they're destroyed. So I, I, think, I think there's plenty we can learn, but it depends on what kind of game you're making. Yeah. What is your view on choices that may spiral out of the player's control or even like their foresight? For example, on one hand, in a Walking Dead game, a choice you made an hour ago could come back and haunt you, and it would make the player feel like regret for their decision. But then you have other games like Mass Effect, where you just you pick the option that says be rude to the to like the reporter, and instead you just suffer a puncher in the face, and suddenly you're feeling very distant from the character, and you end up presenting the character that you're supposed to be like embodied. Next question. <laughs> I prefer the telltale approach. <laughs> yeah. You said earlier that um, multiplayer is a way of cheating for creating your own stories. But wouldn't multiplayer invite more way or more ways to tell stories or more stories to tell? Yeah, I was I was kind of being a jerk. I, you know, I've I, I've never made a multiplayer game, and I, I would very much like to try it, but. I don't want to say to do it right. To do it the way I imagine it would require um, an automated dungeon master of some kind who could really adapt the story to the, to the choices being made by the, the group. That's actually kind of true of a single player game too. If anybody knows how to make a, an automated dungeon master that can dynamically adjust gameplay, not just difficulty, we do that already, but dynamically adjusting gameplay to meet the needs of the players, whew, that'd be powerful. Well, but then why not? Why not? Yeah, so using the computer as a, I mean, what? Just sit down and tell a story. Play D and D. You know, just just go play D and D. That uses dice, <laughs> hoisted by his own petard. Yeah. Well, uh, how would I how would I have choice impact a game like Mario? I wouldn't. It's like I, I said, I, I hope I said clearly twice that I'm not saying everybody should make games like this, uh, or that everybody should play games like this, or, or want to play games like the ones I described. Um, I'm not going to tell Mr. Miyamoto how to make games. <laughs> That's not. That would be crazy, uh, crazy talk. Um, so you know, there there are so many. I mean, I. I I wouldn't make a game like Telltale either. 
career. But I love playing them, you know? I, I love playing Mario games. So, uh, I mean, if you ask me what my favorite, my favorite game is, it's The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, you know? And, um, but it's not like you got a lot of choices in that game, right? Hold on. You already asked a question. Who had, you have not asked a question. Uh, the questions you asked, you kept in mind while creating the were drastically different than the questions you kept in mind while making the game. And very different from the ones I'm thinking about on System Shock 3. Right. And this afternoon too. My, my big personal goal is to sell one more copy of a game than necessary to get someone to fund my next one. You know, well, I don't know what that number is, but I've been lucky because I've always gotten a deal. Um, and I think the art of games is in understanding well enough what players want that you can attract an audience. So I, I'm on, in my future work, I am going to try paying more attention to uh, data-driven design because I think it's interesting, but I don't think I'm going to like it much. Um, so no, the questions come right out of my head because I think it would be interesting for players to explore them. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. I still think VR is a fad. Um, let me clarify one thing. I, ha I am a man of many mottos, and one of them is people don't remember moderate statements. Okay, and if you if if I say yeah, VR is okay. That's the end of a discussion. If I say VR is a fad, everybody in the world comes down on me like a ton of bricks. And it gets people talking and arguing. And um, I, I meant every word I said, OK? But what I heard as a result of making that outrageous statement was lots of people telling me, behind closed doors, we're all thinking about those problems. OK? We're just not saying it publicly. And I said, that's really stupid. You should be talking about them publicly. And their response was, why should we? We're getting billions of dollars. Why would we point out our problems? Which makes logical sense, but it's kind of scummy. I get that, but I mentioned some two problems you brought up in that quote. Oh. Uh, well, well, wait, what's the other one? The one that where you can see your... your pass through camera. Yeah, pass through camera's great, for sure. If, if no one gets motion sick in class. Chef 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 says if you get sick with the design install, that's perfectly accurate. If you can hunt the demos, even if you're a lady who say you can't go on roller coasters, no one will bring a single uh, video. I think that solves two very, very big problems. Okay, and I think it's likely that I will be doing some VR work in the future because I find it fascinating as a developer. I still have big questions about it. I mean, uh, like Mike Caps earlier. I don't know if you were in his his little fireside session, but he said we're all because we all have phones. We're already used to being isolated. You know, I mean, I could pull my phone out right now and I would be isolated from you. But but that's not a that's an unreasonable argument. It doesn't hold any water because it's not like this, <laughs> you know. I, VR is not a public thing and never will be. It is a private, situational thing. It's social, but it's private. Uh, it'll be social in five years, maybe. It's not social at all. Toy box is pretty close, yes. Yeah. Of course I'm thinking about it. I, I supported VR in 1994. Yeah, terrible, yeah. I mean, well, it, it, all we had, well, it's marginally better now. Um, yeah, anyway, we can continue this later if you want. Yeah. Um, so you say that Dungeons & Dragons is a, big, is a big influence on your game design, but um, what about the text adventure games from the early 80s? Um, do, do you think that's more, um, more of a conversation between Uh, do I think text adventures provide a model 
for us today? Should, should we look back on them? Uh, I think some people should. Again, Telltale, I've told these guys this a hundred times. I mean, the guys at Telltale. And I, I love Telltale games. But what they're doing is they're writing pick-a-path books with pretty pictures. Okay? And, and that's great. And if you look at um, David Cage's stuff, it's five movie scripts jammed together. You know? And that's great. But that's not what I do. You know, more power to them. I love that they do them. I mean, Heavy Rain was a great game, and, and the first season of The Walking Dead was phenomenal, and I'm, you know, Game of Thrones, I think, was, was swell, and I wasn't crazy about Wolf Among Us, but I'm not quite sure why. I need to think about that more. Um, but I, I don't think we should look to that for more inspiration. I think some people who want to make games like that should, and I'm sure they do. I wore you out. No, I didn't. Yeah. Um, so when you're uh, creating or developing a narrative, um, how often or do you even um, seek out advice from experts in maybe psychology or social work to understand um, the emotional response from your character or a player? Uh, how often do I consult experts in psychology or social work uh, in, in uh, planning out effects. Um, not very much, but I will tell you that when people ask me what should they study in school if they want to be a game designer, I tell them first thing, get a book about behavioral psychology, get a book about economics, I mean t uh, take courses, I'm sorry, take courses in behavioral psychology, take courses in economics, learn some programming, don't ignore history, learn to write, you know, join Toastmasters, learn to speak. Um, so I think about that stuff a lot, but uh, I, I'd be lying if I said I'd consulted a lot of experts. Uh, I, uh, there, years and years ago, Gabe Newell gave me a present that was a book just called Behavioral Psychology, and I read it, and it was like world changing. Yeah, I cannot even see you because of those crazy lights. But go, you, yes. You who I can barely see. You, you have a halo around you like you're some religious figure or something. <laughs> Epic Mickey 3? Um, the answer is I can't. I mean, you know, Disney shut down Junction Point uh, and laid off about 2,000 people or some crazy number. Don't, don't quote me on that. It was some crazy number. Um, and they obviously own Mickey Mouse, not me. Um, I will say that uh, other than my, my commitment to other side aside, if, if I were ever a free agent again and Disney asked me to come back, I would come back in a heartbeat to do an Epic Mickey 3. Or a duck game. I've, I've always wanted to do a, you know, a DuckTales or, or a Scrooge McDuck game. I know, DuckTales, woohoo. Yeah. generalize that, okay, bef bef instead of moving on to the next question. Um, there are way more games that offer you the appearance, the illusion of choice than real choice. Uh, it's, not just, it's, it's not just Bioshock Infinite, okay. Um, I'm choosing my words very carefully at this moment. Um, that's very common, and I personally hate it. I, I think we have the capability of offering choices that matter, and when we don't, I think it's a real shame. Yeah. So a lot 
lot of games have fully fleshed out characters. And how do I feel about that? Uh, same answer I've given to a bunch of other questions. It depends on what kind of game you're making. Um, you know, Amy Hennig is one of my favorite people, and she fleshes out her characters as well as anybody in, on the planet. Um, you know, I mean, there are lots of games that have, uh, Lara Croft has a distinct personality, and that's awesome. I will just never make a game like that as long as I live. I mean, there's a reason why in the Ultima games you're called the Avatar. There's a reason why in System Shock you're called the Hacker. There's a reason why J.C. Denton had no, I was going to curse, I promised myself I wouldn't curse. He had no personality at all. <laughs> you know, he had a name, but that was it. Um, so I, I just wouldn't make a game like that. But there are plenty of wonderful games that tell better stories than I've ever told. Uh, Partly because they flesh out their characters. Holy cow, you guys are insatiable. Yeah. What exactly is your method for mining, especially when you've got branching paths and where those go? Well, I don't exactly do branching narratives. It's, a, it's, it's different, it's subtly different. And what I do is I hire great programmers who can write. Uh, I, I started out hiring writers thinking I could turn them into, into pseudo-coders and basically ended up firing every one of them. Um, and so uh, I started looking for programmers who were also great writers. Not, it's, this is not a case of, oh, I write email, and so I, I'm a writer. Um, this is a case of really finding programmers who are great writers, and I, I make them show me their writing samples and their publications and all that. Those, those people exist in the world, and they are, as far as I'm concerned, the best game writers. Yeah. to have some backstory. I mean, I knew exactly what J.C. Denton and Paul Denton's backstory was. And Mickey Mouse has a backstory, you know? Um, and sometimes you can use that. I, I like in, in the Epic Mickey games, uh, we went right back to what's called the Disney Standard Character Guide and found the 16 characteristics that, that define that character and whittled it down to the eight that we could express in a game. And then everything Mickey did in the game was in service of those those eight characteristics. We didn't allow the player to move outside of that, you know. So I think there's some level of fleshing out that's okay, but that's the art. You can't go too far with it, or the player is going to be distanced from from the experience, and that's the last thing I want. answer is, I hope it can be done. Okay. And keep your eyes and ears open. Oh. Yeah. I have a whole lecture about that, too. Maybe I should give my creative starting points lecture this afternoon instead of the one I was going to give. Um, I've started projects in every way you can imagine. I've started with a mechanic, I've started with a story, I've started with a setting, I've started with a character, I've started with the questions. Um, I have, the, the one thing that is consistent is I have a, a process I use in evaluating whether a concept is worth pursuing, and it involves a series of questions I ask myself. They're, no, they're, they're, these are a different kind of question. Um, like, has anybody done this before? You know, are we the right people to do it? What, uh, what pop cultural relevance does this have? Because I don't want to convince people to be interested in something. That's a, that's a loser's bet. Um, 
but I go through that. That's, that takes me about five pages. And then I've got a, a two-page template, concept uh, pitch template that I, that I fill out that can go as long as actually 13, 15 pages. And everybody who works for me has to do both of those things if they're pitching me a concept. Um, which is an answer to a question you didn't ask. I've gone. I've done. I've done every way you can possibly think of starting a project. Yeah. Do you think there is value in a game narrative that is not playable, or is that too far in opposition to the greatest strength of video games? Is there value in a in a game that is a narrative that is not replayable? Um, of course there is. I mean, again, it, it, I, I, I feel like a broken record. Um, there's room for for every sort of game imaginable, you know. Uh, it all depends on what you want to do. And I'm an evangelist for a particular kind of game because I've been trying to recreate the D&D &D experience without the die, oh, he's gone, without the die rolls and character classes and stuff. But um, it is absolutely possible to make a game that, I mean, Half-Life, you know, it's completely linear. <laughs> Start to finish, right? And that's a great game. So of course, of course, it's possible, and and even desirable. And you know, there are there are times when, when I don't want to think, I don't want to sit there and go, oh, I want both of these, and I can only have. I mean, there are times when I just want to turn my brain off and go blast stuff. Yeah. sure I can actually talk about that even now. I'm sorry. There, there, there are things that, that probably should remain secret, at least in, until, you know, I, until I, I die and we release all of my papers, you know, somewhere. Am I being told I need to leave? I'm being told I need to leave. Okay. Uh, I will happily stay outside and answer questions for a little while if you're interested.